Well, thank you, Neville, and uh, good evening, everyone. Normally I'd say uh, thank you for braving the cold, um, but I'm sure you're tucked up home, uh, warm, wherever you are. Yes, there's uh, some brave souls who have braved the cold here. Uh, so tonight, as Neville was mentioned, uh, we're going to consider the Nazarite um, and the Nazarite vow. So um, the things we're going to look at um, tonight by way of introduction, we'll look at the vow itself and see how just, just how special a vow uh, it actually is. We'll, of course, look at the three main components of the vow itself. Uh, we'll also look at why you might take the Nazarite vow and who could take the vow. Uh, we'll also have a look at some of the more famous examples we find in Scripture of the vow. And finally, um, we'll consider how the vow can be applied to us uh, in 2020. So if you're not there already, uh, if you could turn to Numbers chapter 6, where we find uh, the details and instructions of the Nazarite vow itself. So Numbers chapter 6, um, in the first few verses... Again, the Lord said to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When a man or woman takes, makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to de dedicate himself to the Lord. So in this introduction of the Nazarite vow, the Lord uses the word special to describe the Nazarite vow. So why is the Nazarite vow considered a special vow? And what makes this vow special? Well, the Hebrew word used for special here comes from the Hebrew root, root word, uh, something like pala, and can mean either great, difficult, wonderful, marvellous, hidden or separate. The first use of this word in the scriptures is found in the conversation between Abraham and the Lord in Genesis chapter 18, um, Genesis 18, 13 and 14, which says... And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. So when God confirmed the promise of a son to Sarah and Abraham, Sarah laughed to herself as she struggled to believe that such a thing could happen uh, to them in their old age. And the Lord responded to Sarah's laughter with the question, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Which in Hebrew is translated, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? So the ability and the power of the Lord is characterised by something great, by something separate or by something wonderful. And so where else is this word used in the Bible? Uh, if we look in Judges 13 verse 19, uh, says, so Manoah, which was, who was Samson's father, took the kid uh, with the cereal, cereal offering and offered it, offered it upon the rock to the Lord, to him who works wonders. And that uh, word translated wonders is that Hebrew word palah. Um, the NIV on that same verse says, the Lord did an amazing thing um, while Manoah and his wife watched. Uh, the word is also used in Psalm 77, uh, verse 11, uh, which says, I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord, yea, I will remember thy wonders of old. For that same verse, the NIV has miracles. So these verses and others demonstrate the importance and the wonder of the vow itself. Um, and if we actually look at the word that's used um, Regarding Nazarite itself, we learn that um, it comes from a Hebrew term, Nazir, which means to separate, um, and it's with, that itself is derived from the Hebrew root word, Nazar, meaning to separate. So essentially, the vow involves um, doing extraordinary things so that something extraordinary might be done to you and in you. It's really an expression or a declaration of a person's willingness to do something extraordinary. So if we take a closer look um, at the components of the vow, we really find there are three main components um, that were, or requirements of the vow. 
And so the first requirement of the Nazarite vow uh, was revolved around um, no wine. And we find that in uh, verse 3 and 4 of number 6, which says, He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink, and shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes fresh or dried. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. So as we can see, this component of the vow involves the removal of wine and, if you like, associated grape products from your life. Now, this may or may not seem such an issue or a sacrifice for, for us today, although, of course, we do live in one of the leading wine-growing regions of the world. But if you consider that in the Israelites' culture, they use wine to celebrate so many things, um, the importance, I think, um, it becomes far more important when we consider that. So if we consider that uh, in the Israelite culture, national days of celebration or remembrance were ushered in uh, by drinking wine, um, the Passover itself was celebrated with drinking four cups of wine. Um, we actually think it was one cup they filled four times to symbolise uh, symbolize four promises that God made to the Israelites. Um, by way of aside, those four promises were that he would uh, take them out, that he would rescue them, that he would redeem them, and he would uh, bring them to himself. But if we consider also that in the ancient world, grapes also represented fruitfulness. If you think of um, what did the spies um, bring back from the promised land, well, they brought back a bunch of grapes. And what was the first thing that Noah planted when everything had been destroyed by the flood? Well, it was a vineyard. So the removal of wine from one's diet would have radically altered the typical way of Israelite life. It was such a major part of their lives at the time. And of course, it's important to note it's not just wine itself. Um, as we read, it's anything that really comes from the grapes, the seeds or the, or the skins. So abstaining from wine and, and, I guess, wine products or products of the vine would have separated the Nazarite, and it's him or her, from normal, um, some normal social occasions, perhaps. Uh, but also um, the lure of temporary luxury and excess is perhaps a reminder of the fruit that led man into sin in the Garden of Eden. The abstaining from fermented drink also signified that the Nazarite's acceptance of a time or of, of a life um, of service as opposed to a life of ease. Um, we find more about that in Jeremiah 35. We won't turn there. The second component of the Nazarite vow was that they could not um, essentially cut their hair. In verse 5, and we read, All the days of his vow or of separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord. He is holy. He shall let the locks of his hair grow long. So not cutting your hair would, of course, result in the hair on your head or a man's beard grow, growing extremely long. So what was the reason for this? Well, I would suggest that it was to make it clear that when you met someone who had unusually long hair, it would be or should be immediate, immediately obvious that they had taken the Nazarite vow. They could see the outward demonstration of your vow. This would also allow fellow Israelites to hold the person accountable, i.e. not inviting them to a wine tasting ceremony or perhaps a fundraising event where you may have to shave your head. And for those of you who know Joseph Cheek, this is um, particularly relevant some years ago. So not cutting the hair or the crown of one's head becomes a visible sign of the Nazarite's sworn oath and consecration to the Lord who is his or her strength. The hair uncut shows an unrestrained commitment to one's vow, only allowing divine power to act um, and, and, of course, confidence in God's promise of strength to fulfil. And of course, famously, Samson's long hair was his God-ordained strength. And we'll look at that um, later on. 
Interestingly, when the period of the vow uh, came to an end, God actually took something from your body. And as we read, it was all of the hair uh, was actually shaved and burnt. And that's in verse 18. Uh, it says, And the Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head at the uh, door of the tent of meeting, and shall take the hair from his consecrated head and put it on the fire, which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. The third uh, major component of the vow is that they weren't to go near a dead body, and this is in verses 6 and 7. I think it's important to remember that, of course, at the time there were no ambulances or hospitals or funeral homes um, like we have today. It's also important to remember that most family members would have lived in relative close proximity to each other. So death was really uh, far more a, a part of everyday life than it is for us today. I think it's the, the separation from the corruption of, of death accentuates his or her holiness and the attachment to that which is incorrupt, incorruptible. From these um, three components of the vow, we can really see that it would mean a radical change in one's life. So, moving along, how long did the vow last? Well, it's, it's an interesting point, and in some ways we don't really know. It really depends on the duration um, of the vow, and that the duration of the vow may have been in proportion to how serious the person was about having God's involvement in their lives. Um, there are historical references to people entering into the vow for 30 days, 90 days, a year, three years, seven years. Um, we'll look at examples of Samuel and, and Samson who um, it would seem committed for life. So why would you take the Nazarite vow or who could take the vow? Well, it's quite clear and I've referred to it a few times, but in, in verse 2 um, it clearly says whether when either a man or a woman makes a special vow. So clearly um, anyone could take this vow. But the swearing of a lifetime oath allowed a man or woman to serve God without the necessary bloodline of Aaron to link him to the ministerial service in the temple. The requirements of the Nazarite are in fact similar to that of the Levitical priesthood. So if you consider that a priest had to abstain from wine during his period of service in the sanctuary, um, and he was to avoid all defilement from coming into contact with the dead, uh, except in the case of his nearest relatives. The difference is that the Nazarite's vow imposed a more severe obligation in that the Nazarite had to abstain from wine and all products of the vine for the entire length of his vow. And like a high priest, he could not even bury his parents, um, and he could not cut his hair for the length of the vow. Like the Levitical priesthood, the Nazarites were permitted to assemble within the precincts of the temple and were provided with their own special enclosure, uh, as we read from history, known as the Nazarites' chamber. Also, according to the, I think it's pronounced the Mishnah, which is the oral tradition of the, um, of the Old Testament, essentially, if a Nazarite took an oath of service for an indefinite period of time, the vow lasted for 30 days, which was, it would seem, the shortest possible period of time for a Nazarite vow. But, as I've mentioned, there were also what we might call perpetual Nazarites, like Samson and Samuel. The Mishnah distinguishes between lifetime, or perpetual Nazarites, who were ordinary perpetual Nazarites, and Samson Nazarites. Both classes of Nazarites were for life, but the ordinary perpetual Nazarite could be um, defiled by coming in contact with the dead, um, and it would seem was allowed to um, occasionally shorten his hair provided he made necessary sacrifices. Uh, like a priest, a Nazarite was to live a life of strict outward ritual purity that signified an inner purity of heart. Uh, there were temporary vows, such as uh, the vow in Amos uh, 2 um, and Acts 18 and Acts 21, or a child could be dedicated by his mother, as is the case in Samuel uh, and Samson. Or, 
or a vow yeah, could, could indeed be for life, as was the case with those two. Um, and they were both certainly dedicated uh, from, from the womb, and we'll, we'll look at those in more detail in a minute. Um, interesting to note also that in terms of the time period of the vow, when the vow itself finished, uh, as in verse, uh, we read in verse 13 of, of chapter 6, uh, this is the law for the Nazarite when the time of his separation has been completed. He shall be brought to the door of the tent of meeting and she, he shall offer his gift for the Lord. Uh, and if you read on, the list of requirements is actually quite extravagant in terms of what was to be, to be offered. And at the time, it would likely have been quite expensive um, in terms of what was needed to be provided. And it's quite likely that um, you would have needed friends or the larger community um, to support you in providing these offerings in the sacrificial meetings. <laughs> and the sacrificial requirements for a completed vow were, were really an expensive undertaking and perhaps they may have had a sponsor, perhaps from a wealthy member of the community um, who would help complete the vow. Also, uh, in Acts 21, uh, James actually requests that the Apostle Paul was a sign of good faith, um, sponsor, it would seem, for Nazarites who had completed their vow. Um, we read uh, in Acts 21, So the next day Paul took the men along and was purified with them, and he visited the temple to give notice of the time when the period of purification um, was over and the period would have to, uh, and the offering would have to be presented on behalf of each of them. So Paul, uh, I guess in consideration of James, submitted to uh, the Old Testament ritual, which in many ways had been fulfilled by the new covenant, covenant of Jesus. Um, and really, in some ways, every Christian now has been consecrated in terms of accepting a lifetime vow uh, in the royal priesthood of believers through the name of Jesus. And in the book of Hebrews, uh, Paul writes uh, in Hebrews 10, verses 8 to 10, when he said above, thou hast neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to law. Then he added, lo, I have come to do thy will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So really in this sense, all um, new covenant believers serve God as perpetual Nazarites who are not defiled by death. Um, for of course, our saviour Jesus conquered death. In our vow of holiness, we offer our lives as a living sacrifice uh, in service to Christ. Romans 12 says, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we can see that the point of the vow is that people were so uh, passionate about God doing something extraordinary in their lives that they were willing to give up something that is ordinary or seemingly ordinary in their everyday lives. They were so passionate about God doing something life-changing that they were willing to significantly, significantly alter their lives. They were willing for God to do something almost supernatural in their lives, that they are willing to give up something natural in their lives. So the question really stands for us today, um, how much do we want change in our own lives? So we'll have a look now, a closer look at um, some of the examples of, of the Nazarites. And I've mentioned, of course, Samson and, and Samuel. And Samson is really one of the most recognisable of the judges who ruled over Israel before the time of the kings. And Samson was to be an individual specially devoted to God, just as the nation of Israel was meant to be specially devoted to God. But in ways similar to the nation of Israel, Samson seems to have given little attention to such dedication. 
God appeared to Samson's parents and told them that they would have a child. And this child will be a Nazarite by way of a revelation from God concerning his birth. And prior to this, his mother had been barren and did not have any children. And as we have seen, a Nazarite is one who is devoted to God and they vow part of their lives or their entire lives to God. Samson was a Nazarite uh, from really the womb of his mother. So he was not only consecrated for a certain period of his life, but he was consecrated all his life, um, even prior to conception, um, to God. So even though Samson was to be dedicated to God for his life, on numerous occasions it would seem he failed to fulfil the requirements of the Nazarite vow. And one of these occasions uh, really was his marriage to a Philistine woman in Judges 14. So the marriage, uh, in a sense, was wrong in the sight of God for a few reasons. Uh, firstly, Samson married a foreigner. And while this was not in contradiction with the Nazarite law, it was in contradiction with the law according to the Old Testament, whereby the children of Israel uh, were not to marry among foreigners. And that can be found in Deuteronomy 7, verse 3. And of course, the foreigners, it speaks about uh, here, denoted Gentiles or those who did not believe in the God of Israel. Um, so a foreigner not only also meant a foreigner in faith. And for Israel, the foreigner in faith denoted a foreigner in citizenship as well. And that is why Samson's parents ask him in Judges 14, verse 3, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your kinsmen or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? It would seem that his father emphasised the word uncircumcised because circumcision, of course, was the sign that the person was from God's people. So when his father emphasised the fact that she was the daughter of the uncircumcised Philistines, this meant, of course, that they did not worship the God of Israel. Samson, being a Nazarite, really should have known better, but it seemed that he insisted on being married to this woman. So this was Samson's, perhaps, first mistake. What was another? Well, it would seem that the decision of marriage was based... Um, purely on physical attraction. It says he told his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. It would seem that the decision of this marriage was based solely on physical attraction and on, not on any sort of spiritual grounds. If the marriage had continued, I'm sure after a few months uh, within this kind of environment, the physical attraction would surely have withered and then the person would be faced with the re reality of a lack of any spiritual or emotional connection. It's a lesson for us that marriage cannot simply be based upon physical attraction. Marriage is really a much more complex arrangement involving body, mind and spirit. And a marriage decision should not be quickly not be made quickly and shouldn't be based on purely physical attraction. As Samson said, she pleases me well. This was not a wise or a spiritually discerning decision. And Samson also would seem did not get the blessings of his mother and father, yet he insisted upon his decision. So it would seem his parents yielded to his desire. And perhaps this is often the case when we can force our parents to agree with our decisions when we believe we are making the right choice, um, though they may not be willing to bless our decision. And this was the case with Samson's father and mother. We read in, in verse 4 of Judges 14, His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. And at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. And, of course, this marriage was not uh, of the Lord as such because it was against the commandment given and the prohibition that the children of Israel were not to get married from among the Gentiles. So, but although this marriage wasn't necessarily according to God's law, um, God, who is merciful, transformed that situation ultimately into furnishing an opportunity for Samson to defeat the Philistines. 
uh, because as we read at that time, the Philistines had dominion over the Israelites. It's interesting to consider that at a certain point in time in our lives, God may choose to teach us a lesson by delivering us to the consequences of our wrong decisions, as he did with Samson at the end. And in the case of Samson, it seems that in some ways God defended him despite his wrong decisions. A person, of course, can make wrong decisions in their life and and God will forgive them. But if the person doesn't learn and after repeated, multiple repeated episodes, God will at times let them be and they have to, we have to bear the consequences of wrong decisions. Paul says in Romans 2 verse 4, Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So God really demonstrates Uh, remarkable patience towards Samson on several occasions in his life Um, but at the end he delivered him into the hands of his enemies although he did provide Samson uh, with a way to almost take vengeance on the Philistines one final time. Because of perhaps a weakness in Samson's character um, he started to break some of his Nazarite vows And the Bible says that um, in Judges 14, verse 15, Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Well, of course, as a Nazarite, he should try to avoid even going near a vineyard because a vineyard is a source of grapes. And of course, as we've seen, uh, a Nazarite was not allowed to, uh, to eat grapes. So perhaps it could be said that Samson's weakest point was his desires and his lusts. Uh, Before he went down to this Philistine woman, Samson encounters a lion in Judges 14, verse 15. Um, Verse 5, yes. Um, Which says, uh, halfway through, And behold, a young lion roared against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion asunder as one tears a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Through spirit-endowed strength, uh, God allowed Samson to tear the lion apart. And I believe this was to show him uh, that he was not weak and that he could discipline his desires. God was trying to teach him that my spirit is upon you. So with the same power that you killed the lion, you could help to discipline your desires and your lusts also. But it would seem that Samson, often like us, was deaf and blind to what God was trying to teach him, and he didn't understand the lesson. If Samson surrendered his life to the Lord, he could kill the lion in his life, the the figurative lion, which of course was his desires and lusts which it would seem he had very much difficulty in subduing. So sin, of course, has consequences. And for Samson, in some ways, it came in the form of Delilah, a Philistine woman who Samson fell in love with. Now, the Philistines, of course, used this to their advantage and bribed her with 1,100 shekels, which is about three years' worth of wages, to divulge the secret to Samson's strength so that they could overcome him. Without going um, into detail about the episode, we know that after a great deal of trial and error, Delilah procures the source of his strength, which is his hair, and then his hair is cut. And then the Philistines blind the now weakened Samson and take him captive. Samson had said that she uh, looks good to me, but unfortunately that really led to his eyes being gouged out. It's a lesson for us not to give our hearts to someone uh, because they may look good to us. And trust and intimacy really must be founded on more than appearance and more than sexual attraction. God's ultimate sovereign plan, however, cannot be thwarted by our sin. Nevertheless, we should not be eager to sin in order to prove this point. Sin brings serious consequences and pain, so it is far better for us if God works through our obedience to accomplish his purposes. 
We should seek to obey him so that we may please him and so we do not have to deal with the tragedy that sin can bring. So, I guess by way of summary, um, Samson really ignores uh, much of the Nazarite vow. Um, We read that he he ate the honeycomb out of the carcass of the the dead lion that he slew, um, breaking the the component of the vow not to touch dead bodies. Um, We know he attended the uh, wedding feast, his own wedding feast, where alcohol uh, was present. And although it doesn't actually say that um, whether or not he ate or drank, um, it's still clear that he sinned during that, during that occasion uh, when he killed the 30 Philistines, um, when his wife tricked him out of, of the wager. Um, and whether killing them came out of a sound mind or a mind under the influence of alcohol, um, it was still sin. And of course, as we've, we've mentioned, um, his hair was cut, which caused him to lose his strength um, in, in direct violation of the Nazarite vow. So also, as I've mentioned, another uh, noteworthy character who claims the title of a Nazarite was Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11, uh, we read that Hannah vows the Lord that a razor would never touch her son's head and that she would give, um, should the Lord give her a son. Uh, we, we read, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy maidservant and remember me and not forget thy maidservant, but will give to thy maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Interestingly, the Septuagint contains an addition that her son would never drink wine or strong drink. Um, it's, it's interesting to consider that if the Septuagint is a, uh, I guess, a more up-to-date translation of that section, the translator was explicitly associating Samuel and, uh, with the previous judge, Samson, by filling in the gap and making Samuel a full Nazarite from conception. At face value, it seems more likely that the bit about abstaining from alcohol would be added rather than omitted. But if the Septuagint represents perhaps an earlier <coughs> translation or reading, um, and other translations such as the RSV uh, did omit the part about alcohol in order to accommodate Samuel's priestly role through his um, administration. Of course, priests regularly used alcohol uh, for drink offerings, Leviticus 23, Numbers 28, 29, although they never expressly commanded to drink any portion of the offering from what I could see, although 1 Samuel never says explicitly that Samuel drank uh, or administered a drink offering. But to further complicate both of these suggestions, if the Septuagint Samuel was to be a full Nazarite from conception like Samuel, then it would be strange for the Septuagint to have added um, in verse 18 of, of chapter 1 that Hannah subsequently ate and drank in her quarters. On the other hand, um, this is um, before Samuel is conceived. Alternatively, if the RSV translation removed the reference to strong drink in order to make Samuel not a Nazarite because he was frequently near dead bodies during his tenure. We know that, of course, Samuel went to, to war, 1 Samuel 7. He hacked Agag to pieces in 1 Samuel 15. But whatever may be the case, uh, it seems that Samuel adhered to portions of the Nazarite vow in his faithful service to our Heavenly Father. If anything, I think I've left, um, left some things for us to consider um, there. I'd also like for us to, to briefly consider uh, similar similarities among uh, Samuel, Samson and John. John the Baptist. We know that uh, Paul, the apostle, apparently took a Nazarite vow in a a temporary way uh, because he would not be able to trim his hair during the days of his vow. 
uh, he probably followed the practice of first shaving his head. Uh, this was often a typical way to practice uh, a Nazarite vow. But the three men who are noted to have been Nazarites for the entire course of their lives, uh, Samuel, Samson and John the Baptist, had much in common. All three were born to childless couples. Uh, Manoah and his wife had been married for some time and his wife is described as barren in Judges 13, as we've said. Hannah and Elkanah, the parents of Samuel, were also childless, although Hannah was not beyond the age of childbearing, and neither was she commanded to make her son a Nazarite. In the case of John the Baptist, an angel appears to Zechariah while he is ministering in the temple. Um, and we pick this up from uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. It's also interesting to note that all three prepared the way for David or David's heir, Messiah. Samson and Samuel were thought to be perhaps contemporary, um, perhaps ministering in different parts of Israel, although it's likely that, that Samson came sometime before. They both, both Samson and Samuel, oversaw the weakening of the powerful and oppressive Philistine people. It's interesting also to note that Samuel and Samson prepared the way, as I said, for David, who would complete the conquest, much as John the Baptist did with Jesus, who, of course, um, conquered sin. So the Nazarite vow is an excellent reminder to each one of us of the value of a dedicated life to our Heavenly Father. Each one of us has the opportunity to pull away from this world for a time, whether it be a day, a week or a month, to dedicate ourselves afresh to the Lord and to draw closer to his holiness. There really is no reason that any of us can't take a Nazarite vow today. I believe the connection between the Nazarite vow and the name of God when he is described as wonderful, is a reminder to us that as we draw closer to his presence in holiness,